stay-at-home orders. We're so glad to be able to gather with you here virtually and open up the Word of God. We trust all is well with you and yours as you continue to shelter in place. I want to remind our Tower City Church about a couple of announcements, and that is that directly after our broadcast this morning, there will be a uh, two different Zoom meetings. There will be a ladies' fellowship on Zoom, and there will also be a men's gathering on Zoom for encouragement and prayer. And this Wednesday night in the Tower City Church study group, which is right here on Facebook, there will be a link for a Zoom meeting for our Wednesday night Bible study. And the subject of that is times and seasons getting in sync with God during this time in which we find ourselves so now, before Pastor Buddy opens up the Word of God for us, let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to open up your Word together, Lord, to hear what you are saying in this unusual time that we find ourselves in. We thank you for your sovereignty in the midst of this. Lord, that you are at work on our behalf, and you are at work in causing your purposes to unfold for us personally, for our cities, for our nations, and even for our world. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace during this special time. We pray now, Lord, that you would help us to hear what you're saying to us and help Pastor Buddy, Lord, to give us your word in a way that is full of anointing, full of power, and that it would directly impact us in our spirits. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. I just want to say how grateful we are to be together with you and also for all of the comments that are already coming. It helps us to know that you're there and we appreciate all the encouragement that's coming forth through the comments and all the connection that's happening by that way. Uh, I want to uh, share with you something today uh, in light of this momentous uh, moment that we are in, in God, in the season that we're in in God. And to let you know that as of today, uh, we are making preparations uh, to return to our church facilities next Sunday, May 10th at 1030. Our governor has released churches to begin gathering while abiding by the existing social distancing guidelines, which we intend to do. So unless there is an announcement to the contrary, we will be gathering next Sunday. I also wanna let you know that we will also be continuing our Facebook Live video feeds from our worship center. And these broadcasts will begin at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time, as they have been while we have been sheltering in place. And so as we are in the process of preparing our facilities and looking at practical ways to facilitate our return, I think it would behoove us to also consider how we should return to our place of worship in a spiritual sense. What should we do in order to return in a way that aligns with the heart of God. There was a woman in the Old Testament that lived during the reign of King David. We don't know much about her. We don't even know her name. 
She is simply called the woman of Tekoa. And she was known to be a very wise woman. Now, if you've never heard of her, that's probably not too surprising. She's rarely, if ever mentioned in any sort of a Bible study or a sermon, but there was something that she said that is incredibly impactful and insightful. On one particular day, she had an opportunity to appear before King David. And in 2 Samuel 14, 14, these are her words. All of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. And then she says this, but God, but God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Another translation says, so that we don't stay that way. Another translation says he plans ways so that the one who is driven away may not be kept away from him. He will not waste a life. He won't allow the banished one to be exiled permanently from his presence. The message says he works out ways to get the exile back. This is quite a remarkable statement, I think, that holds varying shades of meaning for us. And all of them center around that word devise, which means to plan or to invent or to think up. The root of the word really means to plait something or to weave something together or to fabricate something in a clever way. The Wycliffe translation says he withdraws and thinks. What does God devise? Well, one of the things that God devises is a way to bring back those who have fallen. He looks for ways to bring fallen man to himself because man is born separated from God due to the wages of sin, which really is separation. God devised a way for man to return by way of a designated substitute. In the divine order of God, God avowed this. The innocent can substitute for the guilty. The bloodshed of the righteous will cover the blood guiltiness of the unrighteous. A life for a life, a death for a new life the blameless for the broken, the perfect for the marred. So before there was even a single transgression on the earth, there was already a substitute waiting in the wings. In Eden, right after the fall, it was the bloodshed of innocent lambs that clothed the body and covered the heart of fallen man. This was a precursor, obviously, to the coming of the Lamb of God, Jesus, who would take away the sins of the world. God devised a way to bring back what was separated from him. He devised a return. I think there's another shade of meaning here, and it is that God devises a way to bring back those who have failed. When we stray and stumble and falter and fail, it's God who devises a way to bring us back, and he initiates the way back. It's a return to him. Why? Because God absolutely despises distance. He hates separation and broken fellowship. He is the God who restores us back to himself. After Peter denied the Lord, after that catastrophic failure, it was Jesus who devised the way to bring Peter back. Even the angels at the tomb were in on it. Remember their words to the women who were looking into the tomb, Mark 16, seven, they said this, 
go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. God devises a way back from every failure, no matter how crushing or damaging. There's another shade of meaning I would like for you to consider today, and that is this. God devises a way to bring back those who have strayed or have been taken. Whenever God's people found themselves in some sort of captivity, having been temporarily removed from their place, it was always God who devised a way of return for them. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon, which actually turned out to be an intentional reset by God, it was God who raised up a king by the name of Cyrus to facilitate a return for his people. The call came out in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 23, and this is what was said, all who belong to God's people are urged to return and may your God be with you. It is this third shade of meaning that could portray where we are at the moment as a people, as a church, as a nation, and even as a world. I believe God has called for a reset, a reset for his followers back to his heart and a reset for his people back to his house. The COVID-19 disruption has provided the means to remove us and also to bring us back. And it is now time to begin returning. God is setting up a unique and special return for us. This has never happened before. We've never been here or done this before. We've never had this kind of opportunity, this type of scenario, or this kind of divine moment. And it would be a grave error, I think, to simply attempt to return as we once were, or to return as if we've never been away. In Malachi 3, 7, God says this to his people, return to me and I will return to you, which is classic covenant language. But then the rest of the verse says, but you ask in respect to what are we supposed to return? Another translation says simply, how should we return? That's a great question. What ought to characterize our return? How should we return? Let me share a couple of things with you today that I think are part of that return. The first one is this. It is a return to our foundations, to the first things, the former things, the things that really matter, that make a difference, the things that we may have left but ought to revisit and find again. Maybe new and relevant and woke isn't really better after all. The Bible draws a real distinction between what is new as in novel or different and what is new as in fresh, something that is neither stale nor old. In Isaiah 43, 19, a very familiar statement by God, behold, I will do a new thing. That new thing can be translated something fresh, something present, a now thing. So instead of the latest and greatest, the neatest and the coolest, perhaps we ought to pursue what is fresh, in the heart of God and in the mind of the Lord. Experience tells us that God's new thing will rarely ever match our definition of new. And it's time to ask the hard questions again, I think. Is this work 
Is this activity, is this program, is this emphasis really of God? Is it God birthed? Is it God breathed? Is it God conceived? Is it God ordained? Is it God pleasing? God's advice to his people in Isaiah 51 1 is this It would be good for you to look back, to look to the place from where you came, the rock out of which you were shaped. Foundations can be easy to disregard or dismiss because they remain just below the surface, out of our line of sight and beneath our natural senses. Perhaps the key to returning is to recapture what God intended in the beginning, in our beginnings as his church, his body, the true foundations. When Solomon built the temple, the foundation was the most costly part. In 1 Kings 5.17, it says this, the king commanded them to quarry large, expensive blocks of stone in order to provide a foundation of cut stone for the temple. The Living Bible says it this way, the stone cutters quarried and shaped huge blocks of stone, a very expensive job for the foundation of the temple. So we know that the greatest cost, the greatest craftsmanship, and the greatest care went into the foundation. There was a period of time when that great builder, Nehemiah, was away from the reconstruction of Jerusalem and away from the rebuilding of the temple. And when he returned, he found foreign, unsanctioned wares being stored in the house of the Lord that belonged to a man named Tobiah. Simply put, it was all Tobiah's stuff. It was his belongings. It wasn't God's. And in Nehemiah 13, verse 8 and 9, this is Nehemiah's response. I was greatly displeased and I threw all of Nehemiah's household possessions out of the room. I ordered that the rooms be purified and I had the articles of the house of God restored there. Maybe each and every church and church leader and church member should consider doing the same type of house cleaning in order to restore only the foundational things that belong to our house, our life, and in God's as well. Is this return that we are on really meant to bring a simplification and a clarification for us, restoring the foundations once again? It's a good question, something to ponder. There is another aspect to this in our returning, and I wanna call it a return to our knees. The Bible portrays bowing the knee or bending the knee as a sign of respect, honor, deference, and humility. Perhaps the best way we can return to the house is in a spirit of humility. Someone once said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Maybe this is our time to carefully consider and reconsider God, what God is saying and doing in this moment, what he is wanting to accomplish and how we fit into his purposes as we prepare to step through the doors of his house once again. It was a small 
but special piece of real estate in Solomon's temple that was referred to as the place between the porch and the altar was a transitional place in the courts of the temple. It's possible that this porch that was connected to Solomon's temple was not destroyed in the destruction of the temple. And some scholars believe that this same porch was standing when Jesus walked through the temple. And it's also the same porch where the book of Acts records several miracles that occurred in this porch. The porch was where the temple goers could gather near to the Lord. And the altar was the actual place of contact with God. And in that transitional place between the porch and the altar, prophetic men would speak what God was saying to the temple goers, to their families, to their city, to their nation. It was a marvelous privilege to actually hear the fresh voice of God. But ultimately, the popularity of the place between the porch and the altar began to wane. Temple leaders and temple goers alike opted for something a little less piercing, a little less penetrating, a little less demanding, a little less discomforting, something a bit more palatable, pleasant, and popular. Gradually, they replaced God's fresh counsel with their own counsel, their own thoughts, their own words, their own opinions, their own ideas, and their own ways. And that process became a violent one. In 2 Chronicles 24, verse 20 and 21, there was a man by the name of Zechariah. He was a prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. And he was standing between the porch and the altar when he was doing it. And his prophetic voice, like many other, was killed. He was murdered. He was assassinated between the porch and the altar by a conspiracy among the leaders and the people with the support of their king. This usurping and silencing of the prophetic voice of God's voice was so paramount and so critical that Jesus even mentions it and recalls it in Matthew 23, 35. He emphasizes the negative effect that it still had on their generation. It was a real game changer. And the lesson one lesson is this, when we opt for what is ours, it always usurps what is his. Our words, our ways, our thoughts, our ideas, opinions, and preferences, they usurp the things of God and it can actually be depicted as an act of violence in the spirit. Paul reminds us in Galatians 5, 17, that flesh wars against the spirit. I think he's alluding to this ongoing tension between the porch and the altar. But humility before God is what ensures that we're thinking of ourselves less, that we're not leaning on our own understanding that we're not walking after the flesh, but rather standing in his counsel and yielding to his ways. We certainly don't want to repeat the folly of Aaron's sons. In Leviticus 10.1, the Bible says his sons displeased the Lord and disobeyed the Lord by burning incense to him on a fire pan when they were not supposed to. They did what they wanted rather than what God wanted. They wrongly assumed that their own would be okay with God and how very wrong they were. 
In Leviticus 10, the next two verses, two and three, it says, suddenly the Lord sent fiery flames and burned them to death. Then Moses told Aaron that this was exactly what the Lord had meant when he said, I demand respect for my priests and I will be praised or honored by everyone. Now we know for certain that exactly what the Lord meant is serious business. So what we're about in all of this is not just church business or religious business or people business or public relations or marketing or social media. This is God's business. And it's that serious. Humility ensures that we respect our God, which is something that he requires of, as he said, everyone. When God's people returned to Jerusalem in the temple after their cat captivity, God said this in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 40, I will put in them a fear and a respect of me so they will not turn their backs to me again. Now I want you to notice what God did not say. He didn't say, so they will not turn their backs on me, but he said, they will not turn their backs to me. Turning your back on me would be desertion, but turning the back to me or to God would be mere disregard. In Joel chapter two, verse 17, this was the cry of the prophet. Let the priests, the Lord's servant, cry. Where? Between the porch and the altar. All of them should say this, Lord, have mercy on your people. So as we begin to prepare to return, the pastors of Tower City Church are calling for a day of personal reflection, fasting and prayer, the day before of our return, which would be next Saturday, May 9. We would ask you to reserve as much time on that day as possible to set aside other activities, and prepare for your return in this divine moment. We will finish the fast with a time of communion during our Sunday gathering. When Ezra and the people were returning to Jerusalem after their extended absence from the temple, in Ezra 8.21, it says, and these are the words of Ezra, I called for a fast so we could humble ourselves before our God and seek from him an appropriate way for us and for our little ones to live. The Amplified says, to seek from him a straight and right way for us. They wanted to return the right way. The season that we are in in God is both critical and crucial. It's not ending as we return, it's just really getting started. And how we begin our return is likely to be how we will continue. So let's just take a few moments to wait before the Lord. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we invite you in every place where this word is being heard, in my heart, in the hearts of every person who is tuning in, whether live or on tape, whether in this moment or at a future date, I thank you for working in our hearts, for speaking, 
for dropping in fresh counsel. God, what we seek from you most is not what is novel and different, but that which is fresh, fresh from your heart. Perhaps this is a moment where we ask ourselves, are you ready to return? Are you preparing for your return, for our return? Will you return differently, fearfully, carefully, and joyfully? Or will you return just as before? How will you respond to this divine moment? Or are you going to return? Perhaps you were one who gradually lost contact and connection with the house, and it's been a while. Maybe you haven't really considered returning or the need to return before now. But do remember this. No part of the human body is designed to live much less prosper outside the body. To lose connection is to lose vitality. It's to lose enrichment. It's to lose function. You know where you belong. How will you respond to this divine moment? Are you willing to return? Maybe you've been out and about or away for so long doing your own thing and now you're no longer able to even hear God's call to return anymore. Will you stir yourself and awaken to God's call? How will you respond to this divine moment? This return is a divine moment that is not to be missed or mismanaged. Father, as we set aside these days preparing to return, may you do a deep and awesome work in us as your people. Whatever your purposes and plans and all that you have in store, we want to be in alignment with them. We want to be in agreement with them. How should we return? Thank you for showing us personally and collectively. As we return to see you more clearly, more evidently, with greater power, greater intimacy than we've ever known. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. It's been good to be together. My prayer is, and our collective prayer is, that we would be walking in deep consideration this week and just listening to what God is saying to us as we prepare to gather together. Don't forget, ladies, you're gathering on Zoom at 12 noon. The Zoom invitation can be found on the Tower City Church study group page. Men, we're going to be gathering at 1230 on Zoom. Again, just go to the Tower City Church study group page. The invitation is there. It's a link. You can click on it. As long as Zoom is downloaded onto your computer uh, or your device, you can enter in and we're going to have a time as men to connect together and also to pray for one another during this momentous time. So God bless you. Thank you and have a great week.